Thanks, everybody. Uh, so I'm John Hug, and I'm from Volt DB. Uh, I'm going to try and squeeze a, a lot of content into 20 minutes here. So there's a lot of things I'm going to kind of gloss over. But if you want to reach out to me later, I'm here at the conference for the rest of the conference. You can email me, reach me offline. Uh, I love to go down rat holes and, and talk in depth about some of this stuff. Uh, I love it when people tell me I'm wrong because that's how I learn. Uh, so I'm going to start off with an example uh, operational app. And this is my, my Beetlejuice app. Um, the minimum viable product for the Beetlejuice app is I've got some Alexa Siri-ish device in my house. It's a microphone that's always listening to me because it's not creepy. It sends discernible words to my servers. Uh, and if it hears the word Beetlejuice three times, uh, it plays sound clips for the movie. That's sort of the, 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 the idea in the movie is you call Beetlejuice by saying his name three times. Pretty classic horror movie trope. Um, so we're going to build that as an app. And this is an operational app. Uh, and we're going to talk about stream processing OLPTP in the context of these operational apps. Uh, it's a little bit different than like a word count or something like that uh, because there's, there's an action. I need, to do some, I need to do something in response. I need to send a message back and play a sound clip and that's immediate. So that separates out some stream processing apps that may not look like OLTP apps. Uh, so the first thing everyone should do is just use Postgres, right? This is advice that people have started giving in response to all of the uh, NoSQL stream processing. There's a hundred different data processing frameworks. And this is often a really good idea. If you don't know where to start, just use Postgres or MySQL or some other technology that's been beat on for 20 years. And there's an incredible wealth of knowledge and tooling around it is not a bad idea. So, but how does this look? So I've got some dumbish client, uh, maybe one of these microphones in my bathroom. And I send audio uh, to some rich client logic in my data center. There's a little bit of contrast lost here. There's a box around this. But, uh, and the rich client logic is going to do some speech to text. Anytime it sees the word Beetlejuice, it's going to add a record into Postgres. It's going to count how many times have I said Beetlejuice. Maybe it's three. It's going to record that it's going to take an action, reset the count. And then it's going to send a message back to my speaker to play some clip from the movie. Uh, so. There's a, presumably some table that you guys can all imagine. This is what it looks like. It's a fairly straightforward, very traditional way of solving this problem. Uh, if I'm looking at it from a streaming perspective, uh, let's just say, what if I wanted to build this app with Storm? Now, uh, you shouldn't use Storm for new apps. This is my opinion. Um, it, it's really, there's so many better options than Storm. I'm picking Storm because there's nothing really tricky to it. It's kind of exemplar as a stream processing framework. You could y insert many different kinds of things for Storm in this example. Um, and, and you probably should. Again, I'm losing contrast on the projector, but that's a nice Spark logo over there. Um, so, so Storm looks a lot like the Postgres app, except some of the nice things is I don't have that rich, that rich user code running somewhere else in my data center. I can move that code into the processing framework. Um, but what I, what, what I have also is I've probably got a bunch of different Storms running together. Uh, but really, I've got audio sent here. Storm might emit to play a sound once in a while if it says I've got three. And I've got counts for my users. Maybe they're partitioned across all the Storm nodes. So the big difference when you're looking at architectures, it, when things are, are hunky-dory, when everything is working well, um, then really there are a lot of different architectures that could work, a lot of different fun things you could try. But building for when the unexpected happens is where uh, maybe the different choices you make can really be either inexpensive or expensive. So when Postgres, what are the different ways this app can fail? Certainly Postgres can go down. And that's, that's either software or hardware. My app is going to become unavailable. Uh, but I could also have problems like I could lose a network message. Right? This is a really common problem that happens that people don't necessarily account for. Where maybe I said Beetlejuice three times, and it sent a message back to play a sound. But that message got lost, and it reset the count. And now I have to say Beetlejuice six times. And that's awful. Um, that's another way that this kind of thing can fail. In Storm, it's not really that different. Uh, certainly a Storm node can fail, and I'm going uh, to lose maybe some Beetlejuice counts, how many there. I might have to say Beetlejuice six times. I could lose the message that goes back to the, the microphone and the speaker. I could have to say Beetlejuice six times. Um, the benefit of Storm and some of these things that are distributed, this is, goes for streaming or databases, is that I can probably fail over to another Storm node. So the general availability of my app doesn't go down just because a node failed. Um, some other things that are important to think about that I'm going to kind of gloss over because I don't have 40 minutes to do this is I can use idempotence 
with at least once delivery. That is, I can have my client send the thing over and over until it's confirmed uh, to get exactly once processing. And that helps me get that th exactly, I want to count Beetlejuice three times. Um, and then other things to consider, side effects ruin everything. What's a side effect? Uh, so playing the sound on a speaker is not a transaction. It's not something I have control over. If the speaker wire is cut and I tell it to play a sound and it thinks it played a sound but it didn't, that's not anything I have control over. Uh, so I consider that a side effect. And good examples of these are when you send an SMS message or you make a RESTful API call. Uh, if those things fail, it's very hard. You basically have to pick, I want to guarantee someone ha sees this. Maybe they'll see it more than once. Or I want to make sure that no, someone, no one ever sees this twice which means maybe they won't see it. But with side effects, I don't have control. I can just sort of build it as robustly as I can. Uh, so can I just sprinkle some Kafka on this and make these problems go away? Uh, so in the Postgres example, and it looks similar for the Storm example, and this is you know, more and more common, I can put Kafka here. In terms of how this helps failure, it does get me some, some better back pressure. It gets me a little bit, um, some, some robustness for failure in some ways. Um, but it doesn't fundamentally change things. It doesn't fundamentally change how I handle side effects. It doesn't fundamentally change what happens when Postgres goes down for an extended period of time. Um, the reasons I want to do this are largely not related to failure or, or things. There's a lot of good reasons. I've got a slide coming up on why you would do this. Um, but one of the things is if I look at this operational app, again, this is not some bulk analytics app, uh, streaming and databases have a lot in common. Right? If I want to ensure delivery, the original source has to be prepared to send it more than once. Whether I do streaming or databases, that's true. If I want to get exactly one semantics, I have to build in idempotent operations. Could be a, a little sub talk there, but uh, that, that's true in both cases. I can't guarantee that a side effect happens exactly once, so do your best. And that systems that are flexible, safe, and accurate are really, really hard to do. Doesn't matter what you put, you, what architecture you choose, these things are hard. Uh, that's why we get paid well. So what makes a hard app? Obviously scale complexity. These are things that everyone sort of jumps to immediately. Um, velocity of requirements changes is something that, you know, if you've done product management, that's something that can make an app hard. Um, some of the things that really matter for an operational app, uh, precision, right? If I want to do something exactly three times, that's much, much harder than about three times. And how important exactly three times is to my app, how much I'm willing to engineer to make sure that it's exactly three, can make the app either not that hard or really hard. Uh, chaining precise conditions and actions, so when something happens three times, do something else, that makes things hard. And non-commutative math. Uh, so if you have math like addition and things, that's great, aggregation, some of those things. But if you have math that doesn't commute, where the, if the ops come in different orders, uh, you get a different result, that can be tricky. Side effects, as I mentioned, and then partial control is a really common one I run into when I'm helping our customers, where they don't control all of their app. Maybe there's two different groups that are working. Maybe it's an OEM and, a, and their customer. Um, but that makes apps a lot harder. Um, so why today in 2017 would you want to use one or the other for your operational app, right? Um, streaming and logging, and I've got the little Kafka logo up there because it uh, sort of defines the logging space in a lot of ways these days. Though there's, there's more options than Kafka, but Kafka's nice. Um, one of the, my favorite things is you can easily T, that is you can split two identical streams into your production and your development, production and your pre-production, um, or even A-B testing data, right? You can, you can take this stream and, and run it in a bunch of different ways, and that makes developing the next version of your app a whole lot easier. Um, I often get really s much simpler clients when I've got uh, streaming and logging because I move more of that processing into the system itself. I don't have a separate standalone client. Um, it's often easier to understand performance characteristics. I've got more of a queuing th theory model than I do like a, well, what's the contention and shared memory mess inside Postgres? Uh, by replaying a log stream later, I can do back testing, like would this have worked better in that situation? Um, oh no, this is, I've got some bad data here. Can I roll back to right before that happened? Um, that's really nice, although you need truncating snapshots, which is a whole nother uh, rat hole. Um, you can sometimes make multi data center stuff easier. Sometimes replicating a log is easier than replicating mutating state in like a Postgres or a MySQL. Uh, horizontal scalability and fault tolerance can be easier, although there are a lot of databases now that, that also do that kind of stuff. So why would you use a database? Um, and these are also definitely uh, subsets, right? There's a lot of reasons. These are just some of the ones that came to my mind. Um, 
when you're using a stream, you have to figure out some way to truncate the stream uh, or you have to keep the stream forever. Right? So a lot of times that's like a per app kind of snapshot. And that's one of the complexities that trips up a lot of people. Um, databases you can query off the bat. Right? If you've got your operational app, you can build in periodic reporting, periodic queries. You have to be careful that that doesn't impact your operational workloads. But if it's something that you're doing routinely, you can build that into your capacity planning. And you can do a lot of really cool stuff uh, that, that is hard to do with streaming, especially in development when you can just write SQL queries uh, or whatever the database uses. Uh, to understand what's going on. And then you've got this great database stuff that we've built up over the years, like secondary indexes, materialized views, constraints, joins, foreign keys. Uh, and depending on the system, some of them have more or less of that stuff. Uh, but you get a lot of really mature tooling around databases. Um, and one of the nice things about them is that you typically, they're more appropriate for apps that require lower latency. Because a lot more of these use like an RPC model where I make a call and then get a response more directly. Uh, if I have things where I need to make decisions in milliseconds, these are often uh, a better fit. There's caveats to everything, but those are sort of my summary slides on those. Uh, so why can't I just use a streaming system and a DB together? And you can, and lots of people do. Um, depending on your app, your problem, what you're trying to do, a lot of people have a lot of success with this. Uh, there is the big catch with this is that more integration points uh, means there's more ways that things can fail. And the integration point between, say, Storm and Cassandra, or Storm and Redis, is one of the more tricky things to get right uh, than a lot of other systems. And same thing if you're going to use you know, Storm and, and uh, Postgres, or, or, or Kafka clients and Postgres, or whatever you're going to use. Um, that integration point is tricky. But you should want this. Right? Like you should want the benefits of both. All the things I put on those, both sli on those past two slides, I want all of that in my operational apps. I don't want to have to choose. So we get into a little bit of the blurring parts here. Um, add databaseness to streaming systems. Right? This is one way we can do sort of the blurring. Uh, so if I've got this store map, this sort of glue code, as I mentioned, between the state and the user code, Storm totally punts on this. A lot of other streaming systems have much better support for how you manage this kind of state, but few of them are really databases, right? They don't have all the features I had on the other slide. They have things like aggregation support, and, and uh, they're really good at counters. Um, I'm doing them a disservice by saying that, but they're not, they're not Postgres. They're not uh, a mature SQL relational database or even a mature uh, different data model database. Uh, so one of the interesting products that's out uh, now that's sort of a new, new product in the last year or so is this Kafka Streams thing from the Confluent people. And there's a bunch of Confluent people here, so you can ask them questions. I'm sure they know more about this than I do. Uh, but you can take your client logic into a Kafka log, and the Kafka Streams library, it's a library you put in your client uh, that manages how this log gets turned into tabular database-y kind of data in, according to your user code. And so it, it basically makes that glue code between data and streaming much, 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 much less fragile. Uh, and then you can emit into a Kafka log or two Kafka logs into downstream consumers. And it's, it's, it's really, I think, um, taking streaming systems and moving them into how we add data business to that in a, in a safer way. Uh, it's really early days for this product. There's a lot of things it doesn't do yet. Uh, there's a lot of other systems, like I said, that, that have ways of integrating state with streams. Maybe I don't think any of them are as ambitious as this project. Um, but you know, come talk to me. Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, so this is sort of what I'm interested in. Make a database that's a lot more streamy. How do we get the benefits of the database if we have uh, benefits of stream processing when we're building a database? Uh, so one of the things we can do is we can put processing in the database. I've got uh, rich client logic and a lot of RPC calls. If I put my user logic in stored procedures, then I've got a lot fewer RPC calls. I've got simpler client logic. All right. Everyone says, oh, yeah, but stored procedures are miserable. And that is well deserved. So some of the things we can do to make this better, uh, beyond sort of Postgres or Oracle or whatever stored procedures you've been forced to suffer through, we need better tools for managing user code in the database. We need better tools for debugging user code in the database. Right? We, printf is even, doesn't even work that well. Uh, we need better monitoring and transparency for user code running in the database. What is my code doing? How long does it take? Can I sample it? Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that we can get a little bit of in stream processing. Some systems are better than others. We can put this in a database. It's just a technical challenge. It's not because there's some fundamental reason we can't. 
the other thing we can do is you've got Postgres and they've got a write ahead log. And this has been standard in the industry for a bazillion years. Right? I can take that write ahead log, put it in front, and I can create an a priori logical log, which looks a little bit like sticking Kafka in front of Postgres. And in fact, I could build this with Kafka and Postgres and glue code. But there's no reason I can't integrate this into my database. I can make this a part of my, my perfect database, right? Uh, and so this lets me do a lot of the things like teeing, um, going to a point in time, there's a, uh, replicating between data centers. Using a logical a priori log, there's a lot of benefits. There's some trade-offs and downsides, and if you want to know about those, come talk to me. Um, the, the posteriori log, which I probably can't pronounce, is sort of the same idea. I want my database to be able to emit events. I don't want to have to query my database and say, hey, does anything change? I want in my stored procedure logic to be able to say, hey, this event happened. You said Beetlejuice three times. Push an event out into my log. And if I've got this a posteriori log, a downstream consumer, one of the things I can do is if I don't want to, I can de-emphasize sort of the RPC responses. Um, and I can actually consume the event from the client logic. So I can use this in a more streamy kind of way where I've got the priori log and the posteriori log, everything moving through, uh, but I've got a database in the middle. Um, obviously, I can horizontally partition the database. A lot of databases do this now. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about this, but you sort of pick a partition key. Um, but when you do this, you want to throw out the, the bathwater and keep the baby, right? So I've got now a whole bunch of databases but I need to present as a single managed entity. I want global stats. I want global reads without extra work. Um, I want it to be a database, even though it's got all this other stuff in it. Um, and, and this is something that I've learned a lot working at VoltDB, <laughs> excuse me, working at VoltDB is I want RPC. Uh, why do I want that this RPC model where a client can call the database and get an immediate response? Because we work with a lot of apps where latency matters. And that ability to, to respond directly from the stored procedure says, accept this call. This transaction is fraudulent. Here's what to show the user on the next page. Allows us to build these real-time operational apps that are really cool. Ah, so where is this going? Um, well, I'll say here, this is sort of where I plug what I'm doing. We're building a lot of this at VoltDB. This is a lot of the ideas that sort of things that we are inspired by that we want to make a better product. Uh, so we've got a horizontally partitioned database that acts as a single system. Uh, we've got per partition ordered input and output, right? All based on an a priori logical log, just like uh, we showed in the last couple slides. Um, we have debuggable Java stored procedures. Um, you could fire up IntelliJ or Eclipse and step through your code. Uh, we've got all kinds of stats about how long things are taking. You can use third-party libraries. We have the ability to emit events from those stored procedures that get put into a a posteriori log uh, so that you can consume them from some downstream system. Uh, and we've got all the database stuff. I won't say all, we don't do as much as Postgres, but we've got a lot of the database stuff that people want, like secondary indexes, ranking indexes, views, uh, windowing functions, transactions, all that kind of stuff that you want out of a database. Um, but my conclusion here is, um, I'll say we're working on a lot of this stuff at Volt. I know Confluent's working on this. There's 10 other companies that are working on stuff, sort of merging these kinds of things. None of these systems, Volt included, is going to solve every problem, is going to be uh, mature enough. A lot of this is not, it's not that we can't, it's that we haven't yet. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. I've got like my prospector here. There's a lot of opportunity to build systems that don't have to compromise for operations. Uh, we're engineers, there's always trade-offs, we're always making compromises, but we can get a lot of the benefits of stream processing and databases in a more integrated way. Um, we're really good at a lot of these things, log, stream, state, individually, um, but, but better integration is a really valuable thing for, uh, for operations. And I've got a whole separate talk that explains why operations is different than a lot of the, the analytics and batch processing where the, the Unix philosophy of uh, get one small tools that do things well and put them together uh, turns out to be something of a nightmare for operations. You really want the smaller number of tools to monitor as you can. So go out, you know, if, if Volt works for you, if Kafka Streams work for you, if Flink and Beam and all these cool things that are out there works, that's great. Make them better, build new things. Uh, I think that this is where we're going. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. You can reach out to me. I'm here next two days. Uh, thanks, guys. Thank you for the talk. Uh, are there any questions?
One question there. Thanks, it was a super interesting talk. Um, so you, you could obviously see that this is coming from a database, adding more, more streaming stuff. That's where I'm uh, coming from, yeah. Absolutely, I yeah. try to see both perspectives, like, but yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from the side, I'm, I'm one of the Flink people that comes from the side of building the stream processor and making it more database-y over yeah, time. Yeah. And I, I found this comparison fascinating, where you said the a priori log, and then the processing, and then the a posteriori, whatever, how to pronounce log. Yeah, I can't say that word either. Yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, the interesting, thing that we kind of observed is the the logic that in that case postgres would maintain if you really you know everything goes to that log you have per partition ordering everything and so on is you basically throw out most of the hard transaction logic right because you have per you have per partition ordered you you kind of have a per partition single writer model almost yeah something like that and so on so how much of that actually really remains? Because if, if, if you actually simplify that transactional model to too much of that, and then you know you add the ability to look in some, into something like that, that's kind of we, how we built Flink, Flink today. I would say it's almost that model, actually. Um, that, that's question number one. And um, <laughs> well, let me give back the mic and come back with okay, question number I, two I, later. I think, that, um, I think that it really depends on the app that you're targeting. and, and also, certainly on the mindset of the person who, or, the, or the team that's looking at, at solutions for these kinds of things, we see a lot of people who are really big into transactions because uh, some of the things they're mixing is a lot of different access to the same system. Not everything comes in the front door through like a Kafka ingestion into Vault DB. There's a mix of uh, maybe I've got one client that's pushing an event stream through from from uh, telecommunications, but I've got other clients that are pushing monitoring streams. I've got other clients that, that, are, that are making, updating uh, blacklist tables and things. And having that transactional model of, I can say that this is time T whatever, and that before this, here are all the events that came in and after all the events that came in. But it's not necessarily like everything gets shoved through a pipeline um, in, our, in our system. I think that in some, in, you could certainly, I think it's interesting to think about in terms of uh, if you do shove everything in the front door, can you get rid of a lot of the transaction stuff? I think in many situations, yes. I don't know that's a satisfying answer. Yeah, that's one of the places where I think we're interested in going more. And, and you know, I say we're not for everybody. Um, in terms of building systems that chain one piece of logic after another, uh, that's something that we'd like to get a lot better at, and that's not where we, we've started. Cool. We might have time for one short question. If not, you can uh, catch John after this talk. Cool. Just a question on the kind of partitioning that you need to use mm -hmm. a database like this. Like yeah. I understand read transactions is easy because it doesn't really matter where they come to different partitions. But doesn't performance tank if you do write transactions across partitions and doesn't it? Or where do you see that? I mean, uh, we've been kind of working through doing asynchronous there that we fire out the thing on Kafka and then repartitioning and saying like, let's make it an idempotent operation and we lose the transactional thing then, right. but where do you see VaultDB going so with cross-partition transactions? So we certainly, um, most of the transactions that we run partition, usually the, the whatever customer uh, user is doing, they've got some big operation that partitions pretty well. Uh, but they do often want to mix that with global rights. Uh, and that's one of the things that separates Volt from some of these systems is that we can do transactional global rights. Uh, and a lot of times we see that as I want to transactionally update a lookup table everywhere at the same logical time across the whole system. Um, people want to, uh, occasionally there are things where there are less common operations but require uh, transactional changes. Uh, the one that we don't do a lot of, but people, you know, the canonical example is like a debit credit transaction. Uh, but we do have a lot of like, you know, read everywhere for uh, where there's like an open seat or something and then book the seat in one place would be sort of a, a, a global transaction, even if it only writes in one place. Uh, there are some other cases where you want to repartition data. So you need a transaction that touches two partitions. Uh, and that's something that having that functionality helps with. But there's a lot of research on how to make that faster and how to do that without being less invasive. Uh, we're trailing a lot of that because we're trying to build a production system, uh, but it's something that is going to get easier and easier, I think. 
uh, thank you. Thank you for the talk. And if you want to, if you have more questions, you can catch John after the, you know, in the breaks. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Another round.